So this talk is called Women's Health 101. So hey everyone, we're, we're going to dive right into the nitty gritty of what it means to stay happy and healthy as a woman, which means that I'm, I'm here to answer all the questions I possibly can because it's your health at stake. I'm Dr. Trish Murray, physician, best-selling author and the health catalyst speaker. So premenstrual syndrome is a combination of symptoms that many women get about a week or two before their period begins. Most women report getting some combination of symptoms such as bloating, mild cramps, headaches and moodiness, all of which are totally normal actually. If you get due, to, and that's due to the hormonal uh, shifts that are going on. If you're getting cramps that are so bad that you're missing work or school, you should have a chat with your doctor. And actually three out of every four women have experienced some form of PMS symptoms, which include bloating, bowel changes, mood swings, depression, food cravings, muscle aches and cramps, weight gain due to fluid retention, headaches, fatigue, and et cetera, of course. These symptoms typically occur between ovulation, when the ovary releases the egg, and the start of one's period, which is the menstrual cycle. The cause of PMS is, is not actually totally understood. It is due to fluctuations of hormones like estrogen and progesterone, but one of the biggest disruptors actually that contributes to PMS is the fluctuation of a neurotransmitter that's called serotonin. This neurotransmitter plays a significant role in mood, energy level, and sleep. One thing to understand about this neurotransmitter is it is primarily created in the gut. So a person's gut health can be playing into the severity of their PMS symptoms. And other lifestyle factors like smoking, lack of regular exercise and lack of quality sleep on a regular basis have been shown in studies to play into the severity and symptoms of PMS. So folks, it's very important to understand that one's entire lifestyle does have an effect on your hormones. At actually any age, whether you're still young and dealing with your menstrual cycle with PMS and things like that, and what we're talking about at the beginning of the talk, or if you're menopausal or postmenopausal. Now, cramps affect about half of all menstruators, but despite how common they are, folks. Wait a minute. Sorry, let's go. Sorry, I mixed up my two slides. Sorry about that. Let's go to the correct slide here on the many forms of birth control. So today, women have more birth control options than ever before. Here's a brief list of the top most popular options you may not have heard of, actually. Birth con there actually is a birth control implant, which is a small plastic little rod about the size of a matchstick that gets implanted into your arm. And this is actually 99% effective and can last up to five years. And of course is reversible because if it's causing problems, the little thing can be taken out of your arm and obviously it is reversible. Now there's also the IUD, which the intrauterine device, which is a small T-shaped device that is placed into the uterus has been around a, a while but there are both hormonal and non-hormonal options that are available now. With the hormonal IUD, periods actually get lighter and could go possibly go away completely. With the non-hormonal, periods may get actually heavier, but also can protect from pregnancy for up to 12 years. IUDs are 99% effective and last anywhere from between three and again, 12 years, depending on which kind you get. And of course are reversible because they can take the IUD out if necessary. 
The next option is birth, con birth control shot, which is an injection you can get every three months. And the shots that are available every three months are as much as 94% effective. And then there's also a birth control vaginal ring, which is a small flexible ring that prevents pregnancy by releasing hormones into your body. And once a month, the ring is placed into the vaginal canal, of course, at home, and the vaginal lining absorbs the hormones and these are as much as 91% effective. And of course, pills, the birth control pill are still probably the most popular option for most people or many people. And safe sex, of course, with condoms should always be practiced because uh, no birth control option listed above protects from any sexually transmitted diseases. Now here we are on the slide, sorry about cramps. So cramps affect about half of all menstruators, but despite how common they are, folks don't really know how to tell what's normal and what's abnormal. If you're experiencing any of the following symptoms, you should check with your gynecologist. So cramps and pain that lasts more than two to three days at a time, pelvic pain that is occurring at other times than when you have your menstrual period, over-the-counter pain medications aren't offering acceptable relief. You're, you're having to call out of work or not go to school, and you're worried that something is not right. If your mind and body are telling you something's not right, you should get it checked out, always. Now, if your cramps are making it difficult for you to go about your day, don't accept your fine as an answer from your doctor. Keep looking for answers. As I said on the PMS slide, some of your lifestyle habits could be playing into your cramping if an appropriate workup has been done and no answers have been found as the cramps of PMS are caused actually by prostaglandins that are hormone-like substances that trigger strong contractions of the uterus to expel its lining during the menstrual period. Now prostaglandins, folks, cause inflammation. And this is why anti-inflammatory medications like Motrin, Advil, or Aleve are very helpful during PMS cramping. But turmeric, which is also anti-inflammatory and more natural, could also be tried as a supplement alternative to the anti-inflammatory medicines. But if severe cramping is accompanied also by fever or vomiting or dizziness or unusual vaginal bleeding or unusual discharge, then you need to call your gynecologist right away because these or your primary care doc because these are not normal. Now, sometimes a fluid filled sac called a cyst can develop on the ovaries. Most of these cysts are benign, they're painless and cause no symptoms. However, Sometimes symptoms can appear as the cysts get bigger. And these symptoms can include abdominal bloating or swelling, painful bowel movements, pelvic pain before or during the menstrual cycle, painful intercourse, pain in the lower back or thighs, breast tenderness, nausea and vomiting can actually occur, faintness or dizziness and even fever. Now, if these symptoms happen acutely or, or acutely worsen and get bad, they could indicate that the cyst has possibly ruptured or that an ovary has shifted or twisted improperly. And again, that requires um, a doctor's evaluation. Now, cysts cannot be prevented, but routine gynecological exams can possibly detect cysts early on and save you from invasive surgeries to remove them and the risk of infertility or any other complications from a cyst going bad, if you will. Now, vaginal discharge is something obviously no one likes to talk about, but we should all know about because all of us have experienced it. But what's normal and what's not normal? Let's find out. First of all, Thick, 
milky discharge represents normal discharge. It should be clear to a little bit milky in color and can vary in consistency from anywhere from watery to mucus-like and thicker. And the smell should actually be mild. On the other hand, yellow or green discharge is abnormal discharge and could be a sign of a bacterial infection or a sexually transmitted infection. Brown discharge may be caused by irregular period cycles. So in between period bleeding, that's light and, and dark or brown like this says, if it keeps appearing, it could be a sign of a more serious uterine or cervical issue. And you should talk to your doctor about that, your gynecologist. And finally, obviously very thick, white, chunky dis discharge is most likely a candida yeast infection. And accompanying symptoms with that would include itching, redness, irritation, and even burning. Now, two of the most common infections that women face are either a urinary tract infection or, as I said in the last slide, a yeast infection caused by usually candida albicans. Now, urinary tract infections start off as the constant feeling of needing to pee. If not treated with lots of water to flush out the bacteria buildup, the infection can spread up the channels to the kidneys and eventually even into your blood and could lead to a very serious health infection that requires hospitalization. But more typically the UTI, you, again, if you feel a UTI coming on, you can get your urine tested with your, with your primary care doc or gynecologist and they will prescribe if there's bacteria in the urine, an antibiotic. Now to prevent UTIs in the first place, one of the things you always want to make sure you're doing is, is urinating after sexual intercourse. You see, the urinary tract on women is really short and particularly shorter than in, in men. So bacteria can travel up the, the, the um, urethra much easier and cause infections in women than they do in men. So as unromantic as it might seem, Make it a routine to hop into the bathroom after intercourse and sex. You'll thank yourself later because you'll have way less problems with urinary tract infections. Now for yeast infections, the best thing you can do is cut back on your sugar. Think about this. Think about baking a loaf of bread or making pizza dough. When you're mixing the ingredients, what do you do? You add sugar or honey to the yeast and warm water to do what? To make it rise and to activate it. So a warm, moist environment and a little bit of yeast and an ultra sugary diet, guess what? Leads to a terrible yeast infection. Folks, it's science. Now, if someone is experiencing chronic recurrence of either, either a UTI or vaginal yeast infections, this actually can be a sign of an imbalanced uh, microbiome or the, the bacterial milieu that is supposed to be in your gut and in the vaginal canal. We have a microbiome or bacteria that we live in relationship with in all of, on all different parts of us, on our skin, in our vaginal canal, in our colon, um, you know, in all parts of the body. So, um, again, if you're having recurring UTIs or recurring vaginal yeast infections, this can be a sign of an imbalanced microbiome either in the vaginal canal or in the colon, as these two environments are also extremely close to each other. Now, what can you do about it? Well, an, um, Probiotics can be something to strongly consider. Another thing you can do to help the balance of the bacteria and yeast in your vagina is to balance your gut with probiotics. Now, probiotics are also important to take if you've been prescribed antibiotics for a UTI, let's say. 
as antibiotics destroy all bacteria, and you'll need some help restoring the good bacteria that keep you healthy and balanced after you're done taking any antibiotic. Now, most people are familiar with probiotics and have taken them at one time or another, but it's, it is important to understand that probiotics folks are pro-bacteria. They are not yeast or pro-yeast. You see, Candida albicans, as I mentioned before, is the yeast that can become too prominent and cause yeast infections in the vaginal canal or other parts of our body and in our gut also. Another thing a woman that is prone to yeast infections can do is take a different supplement called Sarcomyces boulardii, which is a pro-yeast that competes with Candida albicans and can bring the right balance of yeast back into your microbiome. And again, the name of that is Sarcomyces boulardii. And at the end, I can type it in the chat if someone wants to know, uh, you know how to spell that and everything else, because you don't want to say that five times fast. It's tough, it's tough. Now studies have found that the average woman eats, listen to this, 70 pounds of sugar per year. Folks, sugar is hidden in a lot of things we eat, which means that most of us are eating way more than our bodies are meant to handle. Some argue even toxic levels of sugar on a regular basis. From yogurt that's sweetened and coffee in the morning with sugar in it or sweetener in it and granola bars throughout the day and a drink during happy hour, folks, sugar finds sneaky ways to get into our gut and wreak havoc. Sugar causes inflammation, it causes weight gain, causes energy depletion, it contributes to the risk of progression of cognitive decline, such as Alzheimer's, and it increases the risk of many types of cancer, heart disease, and liver disease. Let's look at some examples of ways sugar get in. So the recommended limit of, at, now listen to this, the recommended limit of added sugar in any day is six teaspoons or 24 grams of sugar. And you gotta study your food labels because here's a few numbers that might inspire you to start looking at your food labels. How about ketchup? Two tablespoons of ketchup, folks, is he already 2.25. So two and, two and a quarter teaspoons of extra sugar. And that's just putting you know ketchup on your burger. How about pasta sauce? You know, a pasta sauce, a half a cup, and that's only a half a cup, is three teaspoons of added sugar. A breakfast bar that has, you know, sweeteners in it, listen to this, is 6.25 teaspoons of sugar. Yes, that's only one breakfast bar can put you over the daily recommended amount of added sugar, and you're done for the day but you wouldn't be and you'd still be eating other things. So you can see how easy it is to get these hidden sugars if you don't read your labels and buy things that are more sugar free. I'm gonna shift gears a bit and talk a little bit about hair care. We all treat our hair differently. Some of us spend every morning with a round brush and a blow dryer. Others haven't seen their natural hair color in years. Then some of us grab whatever shampoo is on sale and tie, out, tie our hair back every day. And these all are gonna break down and, and damage hair. So regardless of where you fall on the spectrum, there are some simple tips you can use to keep your hair looking and feeling its best. And as any high-end hairdresser will tell you, do not wash your hair every day. By doing so, you're stripping your hair of natural oils and adding to dullness and dryness. Actually, it's recommended to shoot for shampooing your hair every other day. Now, if you do use a blow dryer or a straightening iron or a cur curler, then invest in a very good conditioner and actually leave it on for a few minutes in the shower because the conditioner 
is better at coating your hair and trying to protect it from those devices you're using. Now, when it comes to brushing your hair, it's actually recommended to use a, a comb first instead of the brush when the hair is wet in particular. And actually start by brushing out the ends of your hair first and then slowly bring the brush up higher after each stroke. This way, the concept is you won't pull at your hair so much and cause you know, damage to the hair follicle. Let's talk about nails. Do you leave your nails on after all? Or would you never miss an appointment with your manicurist? Now to keep your nails looking and feeling their best, keep these tips in mind when you're caring for them. First of all, when you file your own nails, try to file in just one direction instead of going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. You see, this way you'll create less damage to the nail. Also, don't cut your cuticles. If anything, use the device to push your cuticles back. Cutting them puts you at an increased risk for infection. Now, if you have dry nails and lots of hang nails, you can each night moisturize your hands and dab a bit of some concentrated natural moisturizer onto the nail and onto every single one of your nails like shea butter or olive oil or coconut oil. Any one of those is a good idea. And also putting collagen powder in your smoothies or if you, you don't, you're not a smoothie person, you can take collagen capsules can also help with one's hair and nail health. Now, the way you start your day will dictate how the rest of your day goes. So create a routine that inspires you to be productive. One of the best ways to get in the right headspace to face your day is with a few minutes of reflection or meditation. It doesn't have to be more than a few minutes. And you can get started as soon as you wake up. Just sit up comfortably, think about what you want to accomplish that day, or think about what you are grateful for in your life. And then set an int intention for your day, such as to be strong or to be kind or to be brave and send some positive energy towards that thought. Now, if you're not into sitting quietly and that's hard for you, then stretch while you are going through your gratitude list and setting your positive intention for the day. If you're not sure what stretches or other exercises to do, I got you covered. Just go to my website, which is discoverhealthfmc.com. And in the shop of my website, there is a option to link to a free, yes, I said free, level one exercise videos you can use to get started. Now, I would be interested to know how many of you have a specific morning routine and what your current morning routine involves. So if you do, go ahead and type it in the chat box. And uh, after the presentation is done, I'd love to see what you've typed there. So share anything you do on a regular basis as a morning routine in the chat box. Give me a minute to do that. Now, it's also important at the end of your day and to end the day on the right note by creating a nighttime routine as well that sets your mind now to rest and prepares you for a good night's sleep. Take these tips into consideration. Switch from overhead lights to lamps and smaller, softer lights, particularly after eight or nine o'clock. This will help teach your brain that it's time to wind down by getting into the habit of preparing for sleep. The other thing is to have a warm beverage before you go to sleep. Tea or even hot water with lemon or ginger are great options. Plus, the warmth will help with your digestion. Another option is that has to do with temperature is try taking a hot shower or a bath. 
right before bed. Your body temperature naturally dips at night. So when you submerge yourself in warm water, your temperature rises obviously while you're in there. But then right when you get out and as you're getting out and getting ready for bed, the cool down period will immediately afterward start to will cause a relaxation response. Another thing is to anoint yourself with relaxing, relaxing scents like lavender or chamomile before bed. Better yet, find or make a linen spray from essential oils that can help calm your system and prepare, prepare you for a deep sleep. So again, I'll ask, what do you do to wind down for the night? And again, go ahead and put it in the chat box if you do a regular night routine. Now, each person's skin is different. So there is no one set of products that work for everybody. This makes finding the correct skin routine a process that can take years of trial and error and finding what works for you. But to help you along, these tips might help. First of all, every skin routine should include a toner, a moisturizer, and a serum. A toner helps balance and cleanse the skin. A moisturizer adds healthy nourishment. And a serum provides deep moisture, perfect for helping the skin recuperate and stay hydrated overnight while you're resting. Serums are actually smooth, thin oils that deliver a very concentrated amount of active ingredients to penetrate the surface of the skin and boost collagen again and hydrate your skin. Now on a totally different note, for those of those still in the age brackets or getting, if you get a pimple occasionally, don't pop pimples. Instead, help the process along with spot treatments of the blemish. Clay masks can help. And there's a particular clay called K-A-O-L-I-N, kaolin clay. And some, and some water and apple cider vinegar can be very helpful too. So kaolin clay has antibacterial properties and has cleansing properties that can remove dirt and impurities, but is gentle without making skin dry and, and dull and can be useful in treating acne. You would apply to your skin this clay product for, uh, for 10 or 20 minutes. Then you're gonna rinse your skin and then apply a serum. And you might repeat this as much as uh, two to three times per week until if you are having problems with blemishes and particularly acne or pimples, this may help resolve the problem. Now, obviously sun protection is extremely important. Sunblock not only protects you from getting burned, but it also helps protect from skin cancer and wrinkles. When it comes to protecting your body, find a sunscreen that you enjoy and reapply it every two hours that you are out in the sun. Now, mineral sunscreens are made with zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, and today are usually in the form of what are called microscopic nanoparticles. So if you remember, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, putting like zinc oxide on your nose or certain parts of your body, you'd be all white. But now because they're microscopic nanoparticles, you can actually rub it in and get it to the point where obviously you're not walking around with this white, you know, thing all over your body and all, or your nose. And evidence suggests that few, if any, zinc or titanium particles penetrate the skin to reach living tissue. So you're not absorbing this. In general, mineral sunscreens tend to rate better than chemical sunscreens in, in the, the organization called the Environmental Working Group Sunscreen Database, meaning mineral sunscreens tend to be less toxic and more safe. Because sunscreens, chemical sunscreens, can contain ingredients such as avobenzone or oxybenzone, and these are organic chemicals 
that absorb UV radiation instead of reflecting it. So they absorb it, but these chemicals can be dangerous. And animal studies report that male animals have lower sperm counts and sperm abnormalities after oxybenzone and uh, these chemicals that can be in uh, su chemical sunscreens are applied. And they can delay puberty after oxy, uh, I'm sorry, octinoxate exposure in both sexes. And studies have shown that uh, chemical sunscreens can alter the the estrogen cycle for female mice exposed to oxybenzone. So the bottom line here, folks, is that the chemical sunscreens, even though they're much easier to apply, can be toxic to us and can affect reproduction and hormonal balances. The mineral sunscreens tend to be safer, but they're, they're not as easy to apply um, and they do take longer to rub in and so forth. So try different ones and find what works best for you. Now, social media, advertisements, television, and movies can all make us feel as though our bodies aren't good enough. This can lead to unhealthy eating habits, dangerous dieting, and a negative mental state. To combat these thoughts, let's give you some tips. First of all, Let's consider recreating your social media. If you use Instagram, then cleanse your feed of pages that make you feel anything negative. Instead, replace them with things that make you happy. Maybe pictures of animals or healthy food recipes or beautiful art or poetry and body positive pages, not negative pages. Now, if you're having a bad day, repeat some self-love mantras and spend some time focusing on what you are grateful for in your life in order to help pick you up. Another tip is throw away clothes that don't fit you anymore. Keeping them around can act as a negative reminder of trying to measure up to something you used to be. Donate the old and treat yourself to some new cute clothes that fit you and make you feel good. Anxiety affects millions of people, and trying to keep it under control can be difficult. Depending on how severe your anxiety is, there are different tactics for you to try. But if you have mild anxiety that crops up every once in a while, let's try, let's give you some other tips to consider. First of all, you could consider separate yourself from what you're doing that might be what's making you anxious. Move elsewhere into a different physical spa space and breathe deeply for a few minutes. When you're feeling anxious, another option is take a moment to think about what it is that's making you feel worried and then talk about it and maybe share it with someone else. Try saying, you know, I'm sorry if I seem a little distracted today. I think I'm worried about this or that. And it's taking up a lot of my headspace. Please don't take it personally if I'm acting a bit distant. Taking and being knowledgeable or, or acknowledging, I guess is the word I wanna use about anxiety sometimes can help us quiet it down. Another tip or option is to write about it. Thoughts get stuck and we ruminate around, they ruminate around in our head and can get overwhelming. Just get in the habit of taking a few minutes to jot down everything you're thinking it helps you process your thoughts and helps you get rid of them and let them go. Now, self-care is a term that I think all women need to focus on. And we're hearing a lot about lately. It refers to the practice of taking an active role in protecting one's own well-being and health during times of stress. And again, here are some ways to practice self-care. First of all, plan out your meals for the week. You'll include nutritious foods and save money from being, from being tempted to, be, to eat out. So if you go to the grocery store only once a week and plan out your week and buy everything you feel you're going to need in that one time, it's going to be better off for you overall. 
Another option is take power naps when you need to. 20 minutes is considered a prime amount of time for a power nap. Of course, spend time out in nature in a quiet and reflective way. Another is make time to laugh with your friends. We don't play enough. So make time to play and to laugh. What do you do for your self-care? Again, these types of things, I'd love to see what people are doing and what you feel you're doing on somewhat of a regular basis. This next one is another one that I think most all women are guilty of, is not saying no enough. We seem to say yes to everything. Do you feel like you're a bit of a people pleaser? It's easy to say, yeah, sure, when someone asks for help, but you can't say yes to everything. When you do, you'll pile way too much on your plate and end up drowning in stress. This is a very feminine trait, and most women are guilty of doing it far too often. It really is okay to say, I'm sorry, but I have too much on my plate right now to help with that. And when you're ready to put your foot down, use these tips. Keep your response simple. Be strong and with your language. Remember that you're not asking permission to say no, you're saying I can't because I don't have the time or I just don't want to do that. Next, buy yourself some time if you are not sure whether you want to do it or not and use a phrase like, you know, let me get back to you on that. And that gives you some time to think about whether you really do or don't want to be involved in whatever it is. Consider a compromise is another option but only do so if you agree with the request, but have limited time or ability to participate. And finally, understand that it's your right to say no. You're turning down a favor. You're not turning down a person. Now we're all well aware of the metaphor that when you get on an airplane, you are told right from the start to put the oxygen mask on yourself first. But for some reason, something holds you back from taking care of your own personal needs. Maybe you're afraid that if you put yourself first, people will stop liking you, or you don't feel worthy of that self-love and self-care. If these are sounding familiar, consider this list of options. First, you're not being selfish by putting yourself first. On the contrary, caring for yourself helps you be more productive, helps you be happier, helps you be more energetic, less fearful, less stressed, less resentful, and less depressed. And people are going to love you more for it. So set aside time each day to do something you want to do. Make yourself a priority and invest in things that keep you healthy and happy. Would you buy something nice for your friend? Well, buy it for yourself. Would you cook a nice meal for a loved one? How about make one for yourself also? Learn to ask for help when you need it and don't let your pride stand in the way. If people start to get angry with your new actions, Know that it's because there's been a discrepancy gap between how we're behaving and how others want us to behave. As long as you're true to yourself, those who truly love you will support you in your push to care for yourself. The people who are worthy of being in your life will prefer you to be happy and healthy rather than miserable. So make yourself a priority. Now, as women, we're often bullied by society to fit into a particular mold. We feel like we're supposed to be a certain shape, have smooth skin, wear the right clothes, act the right way, eat the right things. But folks, no one can fit into all those expectations and still be happy. No one. 
So don't be fooled into thinking that you're not good enough because you can't fit into all of society's expectations. You know, sometimes choose the French fries over the salad every once in a while. Let the hair grow on your legs for a day or two more than you usually do. Don't feel ashamed for choosing to say no to something you don't want to do. You are a fantastic, beautiful, intelligent, and worthwhile human who deserves to take up space in this world. And don't be sorry about it. So I hope some of these tips have helped. Now this class was put together for you by using information from certain sources. And every month after the webinars, we post the list of resources in typically our Discover Health Facebook group. So if you are already a member of our Discover Health Facebook group, which is a closed group off my main site, the Discover Health Facebook page, then all you need to do if you wanna join is go to Facebook, go to my Discover Health Facebook page and request to be a member of the Discover Health Facebook group. Everyone's welcome. You just do need to join because it's one of the closed groups, as you know, on Facebook. And we will post there a list of resources that you could uh, use as links to do further research on your own if you wish to. If you don't do Facebook at all, then you also can reach out to us and ask us to send you to your own personal email the list. Um, and in a moment, I'll list our email address that you can request that. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to join me. I absolutely love presenting healthy information and I hope that you learned something valuable during this presentation. I also wanna add that I am so proud of each of you for taking the steps toward a healthier and happier future.